Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously we finished the implementation of rendering objects with textures including the emissive and normal maps. Using textures opens a lot of possibilities for how an object, or rather the material from which the object is made of, interacts with light coming from the surroundings. At this point we only have implemented direct lighting, so the material only reflects the light coming directly from the light sources. So far we have been using a lighting model that was mostly used in a time when computers had a lot less processing power and we had to use calculations that were as cheap as possible in order to run in real time. There have been a number of these approximate lighting models, but the one that we have been using so far is the Fung model. Although it looks fine, it's not physically correct and it's not great at shading metallic objects. There have been models that calculate lighting in more physically correct way by looking at the interaction of light with the microscopic surface details and making approximations of how much and in what color the light is reflected from the surface. For this reason, these models are also known as microfacet shading models. Although some of these models have been around since the 90s or even 80s, the GPUs only reached the level of processing power needed to handle those models at around the year 2010. As far as I know, it was also around this time when graphics papers like Physically Based Shading at Disney and Physics and Math of Shading contributed to the wide adoption of physically based rendering in real-time applications and the game industry. In this new episode, we are going to implement a basic microfacet lighting model, and in this video I'm going to give a bird's eye overview of the mathematics that we need for this model. I'm not going into details of how to derive any of the equations. For this I'd like to refer you to the papers where you can dig deeper into the derivations. In order to present the PBR theory, I'm going to use Filament, which is a modern open source graphics engine which happens to come with an excellent documentation of pretty much everything that is implemented in the engine. Here we find the chapter dedicated to their material model, which contains everything we need in order to understand how to implement PBR. Obviously I recommend reading this in its entirety when you have the time. Here we look at a function that's called the Bidirectional Reflectance Distribution Function, BRDF for short, which as the name suggests, describes how light is reflected off from a surface. There is also the Transmittance Function, which is used for calculating how light is transmitted through translucent and transparent objects. However, in general this part is approximated since it can be more expensive to implement it directly. So looking at the BRDF, we see that it has a diffuse part and a specular part. The diffuse part scatters the light in all directions. The specular part depends on the direction of incoming light. Moreover, the scattering of the specular reflection depends on how smooth the surface is. For a perfect mirror, the incoming light is reflected in the exact same angle mirrored about the surface normal. Looking at the microscopic details of the surface, we can approximate the shape of these details as a series of flat microfacets, each having their own normal direction. Here we can see that there are many directions towards which the microfacets are facing, but most of them are pointing in the direction of the macrosurface normal. The variation in microfacet normals is called normal distribution term of the BRDF, which should not be confused with the normal distribution curve from statistical analysis. Sometimes the micro details block light that is falling onto or reflecting from the neighboring area. This is called the shadowing and masking term of the BRDF, also known as the geometric or visibility term. As you can see, the more microfacet normals are aligned with the surface normal, the smoother the surface is and the narrower the specular reflection will be. Now let's have a closer look at the diffuse part of the BRDF. Diffusion happens when light penetrates below the surface, where it's randomly scattered within the volume of the object. Some of this light is absorbed and will not contribute to the output. 
The remaining light exits the surface again and does so in a random direction. This happens to every object you see around you except for metallic objects. For metals, light is either absorbed or reflected. For this reason, metallic objects don't have a diffuse albedo color and we can only see them when they reflect their surroundings. We can map the material base color to the diffuse and specular colors like this. Here we see that the diffuse color is zero when the material is fully metallic, whereas the specular color is a constant for non-metallic materials. For metals, it's the same as the base color. This constant of 0.04 is called radiance and is a typical value for most non-metals. Only gemstones like ruby and diamond have higher values. Now let's have a look at how we can compute the reflected light, starting with the specular part. The specular BRDF can be approximated using the cook torrens function, and as we see here, it's a multiplication of terms, two of which we already discussed. D is the microfacet normal distribution function, and G is the geometric masking shadowing function. F is the Fernell function, which we'll look at in a bit. There are a few variations for each of these as we see here. For our implementation, I use the same functions as in filament since they seem to give good results visually. So for the NDF, we use the GGX distribution function where GGX stands for, well, your guess is as good as mine. Nobody seems to know why it's called like that. Anyway, here the alpha is the surface roughness. However, in Disney's paper, they use the remapping of perceptual or linear roughness, which is a linear value between 0 and 1. This is the value we get from the roughness texture. When used in PBR, Disney's remapping to a square of the perceptual roughness seems to give the best results compared to a ground truth. So the alpha that we see in these equations is actually the perceptual roughness squared. This remapping is often a source of confusion for me, since most papers and resources don't specify which roughness they mean in their formula. Here we see a possible implementation of this function. Next is the geometric term, and the flavor we'll be using is the Smith formulation given by this equation. It's a multiplication of the same function, once with the light direction and once with the view direction. As you can see, substituting the g function gives us this result, which has a 4 times n dot l times n dot v term. Looking back at the cook torrens equation, we can see that these terms cancel out and we can write the Smith function like so. This function can be improved by taking the height of the microfacets into account and we end up with this equation, which can be implemented like this. We can also use an approximated implementation, which is faster to compute. The final equation is the Fernell term, which causes the reflection to increase at grazing viewing angles. A typical example of this is a pool of water where the floor becomes less visible the more inclined the viewing angle gets from the surface normal. We use the Schlick approximation for this, where F0 is the specular color at 0 degrees from the normal, and F90 is the specular color at 90 degrees or parallel to the surface. We can approximate this value by setting it to 1. However, we can also approximate it like this, which is what we are going to use. The D, G, and F terms are all we need in order to compute the specular BRDF. We look at the diffuse part next. Here the simplest approximation is a uniform value which is given by the material's diffuse color divided by pi. There are better models like the one in this newspaper, but as you can see the difference is almost imperceptible. This concludes the basic PBR formulation which is summarized here. And here is the result when we implement it in Primal Engine. Note how the model now appears to have metallic parts, in contrast to what it looks like using the Fang BRDF.
I also added a few spheres here so that we can see how lighting behaves for different material roughness and metallic properties. In the bottom row we have metallic spheres and the top row is non-metallic. And they go from fully smooth to fully rough. One thing to notice is that fully rough metallic spheres are a bit darker than the fully rough non-metallic spheres. This is because of a loss of energy in our approximation formula. We are going to improve this when we implement image-based lighting, because then we'll have a lookup texture which happens to contain exactly the information that we need in order to compensate for the loss of energy. And as I mentioned before, we can see that smooth metallic objects don't have a diffuse color and since we are only using direct lighting, nothing of the surrounding objects is being reflected off their surface and they appear black as a result. Well, this is all I wanted to discuss for the introduction to PBR. Feel free to read as much as you can from the resources which I linked in the description below. In the next video, I'm going to show you how this is implemented in code. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and as always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.